Well, hello there. You've collected your data. Congratulations on that. Now let's get to work on your data and think about the first thing that we do. For our data analysis, we want to think about it in two ways. We want to think about quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data means quantities. It means totals. It means graphs and tables. And this is where it's unlike anything you've ever done in English before. Now, I know you've had your crack at mini investigations and stuff like that, so it's not totally unique to you. But had you never done anything like that, you would never have came across something like this. You need to get quite mathematical with your approach. Qualitative is the quality side of things. This is your analysis. It's your terminology and your evaluation of the reasons why things are there. So we're going to be exploring both of those things in today's lesson. Let's start with quantitative data analysis. Quantitative relates to quantity. Therefore, quantitative analysis means looking for amounts within your data, identifying patterns and complexities. Now, whatever you thought was linguistically interesting before you transcribed your data, before you uh, chose your data, that's probably what you're going to want to quantify. It could be anything really, couldn't it? It could be the use of epistemic modal verbs. It could be the range of active to passive voice structures. It could be the amount of minor sentences within all the advertisements that are using. But I want you to think, what linguistic features are there? You could also start to actually do things in comparison. So you could start to compare the amount of phatic talk with the amount of transactional talk, for example. You could look at ratios and things. OK, let's get to work with it. So you will then present it in tables, pie charts, bar charts, or other forms. It's expected, completely expected. It's something that we will definitely ask for you to do in this investigation. Let's try some quantitative analysis, shall we? On the next slide, there's a list of quantities of language features used by, by participants in spoken language. All I want you to do is turn a data set into a rough graph or chart. And what can you deduce from this? Here's your data. We've got four speakers, John, Mary, Sue, and Dave. And that's the number of dynamic verbs they use. And that's the number of stative verbs they use. I want you to choose your graph form and create your graphs. When you've created your graphs, we'll start to think about what it might display. OK, so you've got your, your graphs drawn up now. They'll probably look a little bit like this. Now, if you look at this, what do you observe? Some feedback, please. Write down your thoughts. What might the amount of dynamic verbs that Dave uses reveal about him? What might the amount of state of verbs that Mary uses reveal about her? Write down a few thoughts, please, about what is revealed by those. This is completely context free, so you can come up with anything you want. I would love to hear your suggestions. Please email your suggestions to your teacher. Pause this, press play when you're done. OK, let's do a little bit more, shall we? Let's look at another data sheet here. And again, turn another data set into another rough table or chart and think, what can you deduce from these tables? Here we have the noun usage of three colleagues at a meeting. We have Rita, Sue, and Bob. Rita uses nine proper nouns to one abstract noun and no collective pronouns. Sue uses no proper nouns, five abstract nouns, and five collective pronouns. Bob uses more of a range. Okay, turn it into a, into a graphs or tables, please. Something numerical, and then we'll talk about what it reveals. Complete that. Right, pause the video, complete that. Then when you're done and you've came up with some conclusions, press play again. Hello everyone, welcome back. Let's talk about some possible ideas that this graph, this data could bring up for us. Maybe with Rita, it shows a massive dominance towards proper nouns. She's using a lot of names. Could she be the person who organises and guides the conversation? Could she be encouraging others to speak? Could she effectively be the boss? 
Sue uses lots of abstract nouns. She might be exploring her feelings or talk, talking utter work nonsense alongside lots of jargon she might be using. So it could be a combination of either jargon or it could be the feelings that she's got. Maybe she's having a bad time. Now, we would also want to go further with our analysis of language. Might want to look at the types of nouns a bit more. We might want to look at what pre-modifies them, what post-modifies them, and what's interesting with the syntax surrounding those nouns. Can those nouns be collected into specific semantic fields? So we start off with a list of numbers, and we're now starting to go deep into the language. We're starting to really explore. We're starting to, what's this task again? Oh yeah, language investigation. We're starting to investigate, aren't we? And once we've done that, we'd think about the context. We'd need to know about the, con the topic and the context and what they could actually be meeting about to take this further, wouldn't we? Now, we also want you to use your data as a springboard for theory. When you look at this, what do you think of in terms of gender, occupation, region, social groups, ethnicity, age, any of those things come to the fore when you're looking at this particular table. I would like you now to spend some time jotting down which theorists you might explore for this. Pause the video. Write down what you can think about theorists in relation to this table. When you're ready, press play. Okay, you may have discussed some of these particular theorists. I'll give you just a moment to think about these. If this is occupation, how could you use any of these? Pause the video, have a think, write down your ideas. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Now, we've looked at that with occupation. I've given you a list of theorists you could possibly consider for occupation. What other areas would you do? If you're looking at gender, which theorists would you bring in? Now, what I'm going to share with you now. Um, sorry, before I do that, I just want to say theories, AO2. It's one of the things you're marked on. There's going to be a short video on how you're marked for this. Uh, later but we do have to have theory in and harry you remember our hero harry cuckoo did the ipa investigation lesson with you who taught you how to use the ipa well um harry's first draft of his investigation was magnificent and it had literally no theorists in at all so that was one thing he had to go away and find space to write about and bring theorists into it he still nailed it I'm going to show you some work from uh, my class from this year. This is um, one of my students this year who did an investigation into evangelical Christians. I mentioned that in the last one. And she recorded um, the use of deontic and epistemic modal verbs in the language of Kenneth Copeland, a televangelist, an evangelical preacher. And she noticed that Copeland mostly uses deontic modal verbs there in the blue, verbs uh, which denote certainty. Now, he's asking for money from people, isn't he? He's a televangelist. So that might be one of the reasons behind that. The epistemic, he has no doubt about what he's doing. So that's kind of reduced a little bit the sense of doubt. This was from the Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood investigation. And whilst it's not data, it's an example of how you can really organise your quotations before you start to put them into tables and graphs or before you start to analyse them. And what the student's done here is he's looked at uh, particular adjectival phrases and noun phrases. Uh, and then he's turned them into positive utterances and negative utterances. And then he can analyse further. I, would, I want to see tables like this if you're going to do close analysis of phrases or word types. So tables which really prove your examples. The good news, none of these count towards your word count at all. So you can have as many of these as you want. I'll show you one last example. This was from the student who did an investigation into police language and stop and searches. And he's got a bar chart there from data set one, five interrogatives, three imperatives, eight interruptions, nine epistemic modal verbs, and two uses of, modal, of legal jargon he found in his. And that actually subverted his hypothesis. He expected there to be far more imperatives and far more deontic modal verbs, but he found actually the police used less of those to maintain an impression of politeness. 
Okay, you need now to get you now need to get to work with your data. What patterns can you spot? What's interesting? Are there any anomalies? Is there anything you didn't expect to be there? How can you start to present and formulate your data? What graphs can you start to work on? What numbers are you going to draw? And from those numbers, what tentative conclusions are you able to start to draw? Tentative, you're not being certain on it yet. And lastly, what theorists will you use? This is big work. We're going to give you a full two lessons to get this one done. So you've got today and you've got two lessons on top. Please use your teachers for dialogue through this. Okay, that's everything from me. I'll be back next time when we're ready to start writing it up with our introductions. See you soon. Mr. Bell, out.